ready when you are. OK. OK, so uh, I would now uh, like to uh, ask uh, um, uh, our officials to officially open the, the meeting. Uh, and uh, I ask uh, Dr. Kazuwa Morimoto from the University of Tokyo, who is also an acting president of the ASPS, uh, to um, uh, address uh, you, the attendees. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Rakovietska Askari. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of the ASPS, the Association for the Study of Persian Age Societies, to the first part of the tri tripartite online conference, ASPS Virtual Event Series 9, Iranian Heritage and Today's World. Uh, the topic of the first part today uh, is law, state, and social order. My name is Kazuo Morimoto, and I'm the acting president of the ASPS, a non-governmental, non-political, not-for-profit professional organization for researchers and scholars interested in the culture and civilization of the Persian-speaking societies and related areas in the Iranian civilizational area. As its title shows, this event, I mean today's event, is the first part of the ninth event in the ASPS virtual event series that the association launched back in 2020 in order to carry on its mission to serve as a forum for scholarly interactions in the field of Persian Age studies. I'd like to thank my colleagues and the association's regional branch in Poland, especially Dr. Karolina Lakowiecka Askali and Dr. Mateusz Kwakisz for organizing this event. My gratitude also goes to Dr. Joan Gross, the head of the association's committee for the virtual event series, who participated act actively in the planning of the event. I'm looking forward very much to learning from the six presentations and the ensuing panel discussion today. As the acting president of the ASPS, I hope that this event will also be an opportunity for those who have not been well aware of the association's activities to take interest and begin to take part in them, in the association's activities. More virtual events are being planned for coming months. As importantly, the association is releasing shortly the call for papers for its ninth biennial conference in Yerevan, Armenia, that will take place in late May and early June the next year. Please visit our website for further information and consider becoming a member of the ASPS too. I thank all the particip participants again for joining this event. Let's make it a big success with active participation together. And thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Morimoto. Uh, and now I, do, I would invite uh, Dr. Joan Gross, uh, the, uh, Professor Emerita from the College of uh, New Jersey, and actually the person responsible for the program of uh, ASPS virtual event series. Uh, yes, Joan, uh, uh, the floor is yours. We cannot hear you. Hello, and welcome to the ninth virtual event series of the Association for the Study of Persian and Societies, or ASPS. Uh, I am Joanne Gross, and uh, as you've heard, I am chair of the 2022 virtual event series committee uh, and director of the Central Eurasian Research Fund. We initially organized the virtual event series during the time of COVID-19 lockdowns and conference cancellations that we all experienced as a way for ASPS members and the community to remain in contact with one another and to engage in current research of our colleagues on the history and cultural Persian societies. And I'm especially enthusiastic about this three-part series that begins today on Iranian heritage of today's world, uh, organized by Dr. Karolina 
Rakowiska, Askari, and Dr. Matus Blakic of uh, Jagiellonian University in Krakow and sponsored by the Departments of Iranian Studies and Interdisciplinary Eurasian, Eurasiatic Research of Jagiellonian University. Dr. Uh, Rakowiska Askari and Dr. Klagis have put together an outstanding program of presentations and discussions on the theme of law, state, and social order. And I'm also delighted that Professor Kinga Paraskiewicz, a director of the Institute of Oriental Studies and head of the Department of Iranian Studies at our branch, is also here with us, and I thank him uh, for his support. I would also like to acknowledge my colleagues who serve on the ASPS Virtual Events Series Committee, um, Acting President uh, Kazuo Morimoto, Evrim Bimbash, and Gershon uh, Leventhal. May all of you participants and attendees have a very stimulating and successful exchange of ideas, and we will keep you posted on parts two and parts three of this series, which will take part, uh, which will take place uh, on September 27th and November 29th. And thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, as unfortunately, Professor <coughs> Kinga Paraskevich was kept by some urgent and uh, well, needless to say, unexpected duties. Uh, and will not be joining us. Uh, allow me, uh, as the head of the Department of uh, Interdisciplinary uh, Eurasiatic Research uh, in the Jagiellonian University in Krakow, and also as a colleague from Department of Iranian Studies, uh, to say just how delighted uh, we are to host today's event and to cooperate uh, with the Association uh, for the Study of Passionate Societies. Uh, and I deeply be believe the question of a common Iranian or passionate heritage is a very important and somehow underestimated one, uh, given the changing environment of the present world, present day. Thus, uh, I would like to thank the speakers for accepting our invitation and presenting the issues from many angles and giving us this special interdisciplinary perspective. Inspiring, as I am sure they will be, the presentations will lead us to the roundtable discussion uh, that you are all invited to contribute. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Andrew Bush, for moderating that part. I think we should also mention that the ASPS virtual event Series 9 will be held in three parts. The other two, namely modern and postmodern intellectual flows, and Iranian heritage as a part of global and regional heritage in the 20th and 21st centuries are scheduled for autumn. I hope we will all meet again then. Thank you, Dr. Kazuo Morimoto for having us. Uh, thank you, Dr. Joan Gross uh, and uh, Dr. Mateusz Kwagis for cooperating on the event. And of course, thank you, our dear estimated audience for joining us. And I will not be taking uh, taking any more of your time. Uh, we will quite automatically, if you allow me, proceed uh, proceed to the first session. Uh, and uh, I will now ask uh, our first uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Sergei Andreev from the uh, Matthias Corvinus Collegium in Budapest. Uh, to deliver a paper entitled uh, The Afghan State and the Traditional Social Order, an Uneasy Marriage of Inconvenience. Uh, and also, as I know you had a problem uh, with uh, downloading your presentation, I will now uh, download it for you. So, Dr. Antiev, whenever you're ready, please start and I will be working on loading your presentation now. We can't hear you. Please uh, unmute. Right. Is it all right now? Can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah. Jolly good. Well, thank you very much, Madam Chairman, uh, for uh, giving me the floor and for inviting me to 
be the first speaker on this very interesting academic mood of which I am absolutely sure we all benefit tremendously. <clears throat> Since we are talking about Iranian heritage and to understand it's not just Persian speaking society, but the entire Iranian um, Iranian world, I would like to focus on the very traditional elements of the Afghan society and Afghan politics. And just to set the stage, I would like to outline the main features of the Afghan society. Um, uh, in their historical perspective. As a word of caution, perhaps to deflect possible criticism, counterfactual references to some primordial features are methodologically fallible only as far as dynamic modern societies are concerned, while traditional societies, of which Afghanistan is a quintessential example, develop standard responses to recurrent existential challenges. That is exactly what makes them traditional. Thus, the main characteristics of the Afghan society are as follows. If you could please just upload my uh, uh, PowerPoint. Yes, uh, I, I'm sorry. I'm trying to. Just uh, just one second. Oh, that's that's perfectly all right. Because well, there is nothing particularly important in this slides. Just the general scope. So the main characteristics. Um, uh, first of all, it's of multi-ethnic nature, and then absorption rather than assimilation of subaltern ethnic groups in the Afghan society. That prompted a considerable degree of ethnic and regional autonomy, as well as a complex system of pattern-client relationship between various ethnic groups. Then prevalence of micro-level politics confined to relatively isolated areas defined by access to water resources. And then ethnic fault lines mainly corresponding to watersheds. Underdeveloped export-oriented national market. Low production economy coupled with continuous competition for resources at the community level. And then also coexistence of tribal and non-tribal segments. The resilient supremacy of community, which is described usually as calm, social and political activities at the expense of elements of modernity. When I'm talking about calm, it's not just the tribe. I would rather follow what Olivier Roy suggested to translate it as solidarity group. It can be either tribal or non-tribal, depending on whether we are dealing with the tribal Pashtun society or non-tribal societies, mainly of the north. And then last, but obviously not least, is the recurring antagonism between Islam adopting a political agenda and tribal social political mechanisms. As I have emphasized the importance of micro level po politics, let me dwell on its institutions and mechanisms. While Kaum symbolizes this tribal unity defined by dissent, which replicates itself. Ah, yes, thank you very much. Yes, can you go to the next slide, please? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. um, yes, well, I was talking about calm symbolizing tribal unity, uh, and it replicates itself in the course of time. The concept of gund, party or faction, channels expression of diversity and individual political interests mainly land disputes as opposed to the common ones. The breakdown into these politically corporate factions can occur at any level, both individual and collective, that is clan-based. Factions always fuse into two hostile blocks. These coalitions are formed as a result of the alliances between the leaders of the smaller groups aimed at the collective defense, often by violent means of their respective interests and against all outsiders. These coalitions have a permanent character and it is impossible to support an aligned one situation and oppose him in another. 
only strong and wealthy individuals who are able to defend themselves because of the sheer number of their personal clients can allow themselves to stand outside the alliances while there are only two options available for poor or weak Pashtuns to be somebody's allies or clients. A person outside tribal structures is absolutely defenseless. His inherited plot of land or share in a communal land property is the basis for his political participation in his kinship or alliance-based group. Acquired property or residence rights cannot give him full tribal membership. Thus, individual migration from the ancestral land in effect signifies an important loss of social and political status and even threatens personal security. The Afghans say in bad kaum bashi, be kaum nabashi, it's better to belong to a bad tribe rather than not to belong to any, speaks volumes of the situation. Bloc's activities have a reactive character. Alliances are activated only when they have to address a specific political issue. <clears throat> Could you please move to the, to the next slide? Thank you. At other times, factions are almost invisible since their members are dispersed over vast territories. Therefore, blocks do not develop any administrative structures and do not pursue long-term political goals. However, this is only one of the reasons why blocks do not develop into quasi-state structures. Frederick Barth, the great authority in Afghan uh, sort of anthropology, accounts for the following disruptive forces which prevent the emergence of a rigid organizational framework, the equal division of rent and other property, and thus potential political strength among sons, constant blood feuds, rapid increase of the number of opponents in contrast to the slow increase of the number of followers of an influential leader, a position of other leaders to the acquisition of personal power by any individual. This precious result in a situation when any expanding centralized unit within the Atifaus alliance system must experience strains, which eventually leads to its dissolution. Moreover, and uh, for uh, some reasons both never focused on that, the periodical redistribution of land practiced by some Pashtun tribes also prevents an accumulation of individual wealth and power. And this periodical redistribution of land is called in Pashtun Wash. Um, and it's not sort of universal across, applicable across the board, it's just sort of confined to certain, certain tribes. Since Bath worked with the Yusuf Zais, Yusuf Zais did have Wesh in the path, but well, not at the time of his field research. As Pashtun social life is dominated by three different factors, kinship-based hierarchical loyalty and segmentary political opposition expressed in bloc politics, as well as the influence of Hans, which is stronger in less egalitarian tribes. Uh, now on to the sort of religious uh, factor. Pashtuns have no memory of pre-Islamic past, claiming that they have always been Muslims. Thus, everything they do is Islamic, even if that contradicts the normative teaching. Again, let me quote an Afghan saying, there are things in Qunar that are not in the Quran, and there are things in the Quran that are not in Qunar. Therefore, Muslim clerics, either of a normative or mystic persuasion, who elsewhere are the custodians of Islamic piety, are held in low esteem. The main religious political role of the clerics and saints or Sufi peers is to reassert the unity and integrity of Islam, challenged by tribal factionalism, often combined with the threat of non-Muslim outsiders like it was the case with the Mujahideen of tariqat e who united the Pashtun tribesmen against the six 
and the British, and on many occasions after that. All these religious figures took the mantle of political leaders when the Fisai tribal social order proved itself ineffective. This kind of political unification can be conditionally called supra-tribal, since the tribesmen are united by charismatic religious leaders who appeal primarily to their religious feelings at the expense of their tribal identities. These religious leaders turned politicians, well, in inverted commas, of course, politicians, whether they are Uama or Sufi peers, are not an integral part of the segmentary tribal structures based on kinship. They enjoy the status of alien guests of honor, living in a tribal environment, before they were included into the state structures as a result of partial modernization of Afghanistan and Pakistan in the 20th century, they often try to challenge tribal authority and create independent political bodies of their own supporters. In Pashtun, this process is called Gund Barzi, party building, literally. And it is similar to the bloc politics missing an Islamic element described above. Frederick Barth provides a detailed account of this mechanism and its implications. Those who are interested may, <coughs> may refer to, to his work. It appears that one kind of saints, namely the Sufi guides, enjoys an ambivalent position among the Pashtuns. They attract disciples from mainly poor background, while men with claims to secular power or to any degree of religious piety and learning never take an active part in Sufi ceremonies. However, they do not discourage others from doing so. The Sufi guide exercises his influence outside tribal organization and established patterns of social behavior. Because of this, in contrast to the Uwama, who in Pashtun milieu are styled Miyans and Mullahs, sociologically they are not a part of the tribal system. On the contrary, by the nature of their activity, they constantly challenge the system. Um, this pattern of coexistence of the Sufi guys and tribesmen is not applicable to all tribes. Thus, Akbar Ahmed maintains that the Mamans do not follow any Sufi brotherhood. They see Sufism not as an acceptable alternative or supplement to traditional normative Islam, but as a surrogate for it. However, other tribes are of a more sort of conventional persuasion. Um, the position of saints within the Pashtun social hierarchy is ambivalent. <clears throat> they are aware that they are of superior status to a member of any occupational group, not fully integrated, um, not fully integrated into tribal genealogical structure. At the same time, it appears that they are of lower status than the Pashtuns who consider them as their clients. In, um, in the moment tribe, they began to intermarry with the Pashtuns from junior lineages only in the 1960s. Previously, they were an entirely indigenous group. Both Miyans and Pashtuns remained distinct social groups with distinct functions. While the Pashtuns see themselves as the guardians of tribal customs, the Miyans' main function is to maintain Islamic symbolism in their host society. Apart from having political functions, saints also help to channel religious feelings of the tribesmen who feel alienated from the urban and sophisticated Islam of the Ulama. By the power of their charisma, Baraka, they demonstrate the immediacy of God's existence. If left unchecked by secular tribal authorities, these bonds between the guide and his individual followers have an undercurrent tendency to evolve into the gund bazi type relationship when the religious leaders assume authority over large groups of people, normally subject to another regular system of authority on a tribal lineage basis. As it often happens in Pashtun tribal society, 
individual relationships resembling the organization of a traditional Sufi brotherhood turn into a new kind of institution, usually identified as Marabutic Sufism. In this case, affiliation to the spiritual guide is based on the collective adherence of a clan or a tribe to a peer's family. Otherwise, the number of the guides in the video follows is usually pretty low. Supra-tribal activities were usually caused by foreign invasions undertaken by non-Muslim countries, such as the three anglo afghan wars and the Soviet and the USA-led coalition's invasions of Afghanistan. The saints and mullahs occupy a position uh, which authorizes them to initiate indirect practical actions such as the holy war, which must be sanctioned and is usually initiated by people with a religious background. These people also led the rebellions against political leaders who intolerably abused their authority. Thus, the relationship between spiritual guide or tribal mediator and his personal followers turn into that between the leader of the holy war and the warriors of Islam. The latter relationships are founded on the Gunbazi basis. That leads to the establishment of an Islamic coalition that may be described as a combination of various personal networks of the Sufi peers belonging to the same brotherhood who allied themselves in pursuit of a common cause. Although these coalitions can exercise significant political influence, they are usually short-lived and arise only in special circumstances. Right, my apologies for being kicked out. I have no idea what happened. My side, can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Yes, yes jolly, jolly good. So I was talking about these Islamic coalitions. Um, they, they basically can be described as a combination of uh, various personal networks of the Sufi peers. Uh, guides, masters, which I cannot activate the camera. Okay, so sorry if you cannot see me. Um, yes, uh, they, they all belong to the same brotherhood and they align themselves in pursuit of a common cause. Although these coalitions can exercise significant political influence, they are usually short lived and arise only in special circumstances because of the all-embracing nature of Islam. Such coalitions involve an association of ritual, social, and political qualities without any clear distinction between the religious and political spheres within a single entity established to address a particular Islamic political issue. Thus, any political problem also becomes a religious problem, and even those who are usually not directly associated with Sufi networks are often dragged into the coalition. The Islamic coalition thus becomes the core of the process of supra-tribal unification, the aim of which is to provide a response to a political challenge. This response is always dressed in Islamic rhetoric, which by no means is an opportunistic political exercise based merely 
on formal lip service, but rather a major unifying force of the coalition. As soon as the raison d'etre of such a coalition disappears, it quickly disintegrates. It appears that the Mujahideen parties, so-called parties of the 1970s, early 1990s, fit this paradigm with the local commanders, commandanon, filling the shoes of Islamic actors heading the coalitions. The phenomenon all too familiar to many actors. The next and the final stage in the development of the Islamic coalition, which by no means always materializes, is the establishment of a religio-political body, which depending on the discipline and the theoretical orientation of an individual researcher is termed an activistic movement, revitalization movement, charismatic movement, or messianic movement. Such religious movements could transform themselves either in the isolated and marginalized communities like that of the Zikris in the nearby Baluchistan, or into incipient state structures, as was the case with the Najbandi Mamet in the Northern Caucasus, the Mahdawi state in the Sudan, and perhaps even the Safavid Kizil branch of Iran. The most recent example are the notorious Taliban and the Islamic State in Afghanistan. There are many historical variations of a sustained pattern of supra-tribal unification and subsequent attempts of integrating Islamic movements and their military formations into tribal and state politics, which should be considered as a product of historical relationships of power within the context of inclusion and exclusion. Success or failure in this respect of different incarnations of the Abdin Rantia state has been shaped by its ability to accommodate relying local agendas, often at the expense of each other. That involves finding a balance between Chinggisi political traditions of the north and tribal Pashtun arrangements of the south. When the state fails to secure the preeminence of the Pashtuns, they tend to resort to violent means, often dressed in Islamic rhetoric, to dis restore the status quo ante. While the uh, uh, non Awfully sorry, uh, I'll just have to ask you to proceed to, to the end, uh, because our time is. Yeah, but I, 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 I will need yes, some, there is some a strict like time that. limitation. Sorry. But one more minute, if, if yes. you don't mind. Uh, yeah, so while the, the Pashtuns of the South, they violently defend their rights for preeminence, uh, the Northern uh, non-Pashtuns, they veered towards asserting their autonomy following the Chinggisi pattern. That was clearly manifested by Northern warlords in the 1990s and um, 2020s. Similar patterns exist beyond Afghanistan. Um, due to a volatile fluctuation of various state formations in Afghan lands between tribalism and ethnic pluralistic participation, religion, tribalism, and ethnicity have often been both the means of state's control of social resistance and the latest form of manifestation where militia type military formations were able to challenge the might of the state acquire a supra-tribal dimension which was legitimized by Islamic ideology and institutions, and occasional even initiate an incipient state formation opposed to the institutions of an old regime. With the relative stabilization of state institutions, Afghanistan faced the problem of accommodating these militias cool king makers, either by adopting their political agendas that undermine common national interests in a modern sense of the world, or bribing them with privileges not associated with modern political culture. That concludes my talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, and uh, please uh, do <laughs> forgive me for interrupting you, but uh, no, our schedule is really quite that's nice. That's perfectly all right. The default is entirely mine. I took some extra time. I'm sure there will be more time during the discussion. Thank you so much uh, for this uh, very interesting lecture, Dr. Andreev. Uh, and uh, now I invite uh, Dr. Stanislav Jaskowski from University of Warsaw to deliver a speech uh, 
phenomenon, low and speech, uh, how oral and writing practices change uh, in low, uh, ch change the low, sorry, in Iranian world. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Actually, uh, although the title might seem a bit complicated, it's a very simple, very, let's say, brief speech that I have, and it's uh, more of a, let's say, a uh, mm, draft of a problem. But maybe I should uh, start by showing how I arrived at, not at the conclusion, but at the problem itself. So first I'll try uh, uh, turning on my PowerPoint. It should work, inshallah. Uh, mm. Okay, can you see something? Yes, can you see, we can see yes. a very nice picture of uh, Majlis. Majlis. And this kind of shows you uh, where I started because it's a kind of a problem which uh, was interest or became interested thing for me. Uh, by starting at kind of the end point. So why? Uh, as some of you possibly know, I have began researching the uh, what's left, let's say, of the uh, minutes of the first uh, uh, Majlis. I mean, the one from that began in 1906. Uh, and uh, it kind of struck me, uh, basically, why do these uh, minutes or what's left thereof look as they do? Why are the phrases written in such a way and so on? When at the period, when you look at the uh, minutes uh, of the Western parliaments, which might have been, a, uh, let's say, uh, an example for uh, those uh, writing in Iran, you have either complete, let's say, more or less verbatim speeches, obviously edited or debates, I mean, or you have, uh, when it's published in a newspaper, it still looks a lot different than what they did in Iran. It would be more in a, let's say, narrative form, not uh, mm, in a way that it's not actually the exact minutes themselves are not interesting for us right now. And it got me thinking basically, well, What's a parliament? What are the minutes of the meeting or let's say deba debates of the parliament or parliamentary, report parliamentary reporting, what is it? And it kind of got me that uh, to fully understand uh, the subject, I should look at the development of a few uh, other issues, few, few other phenomena uh, in uh, most Iran, but in uh, let's say Persian it word in general. So obviously parliament is an assembly, so one should look at the uh, various types of assemblies. Is uh, its uh, proceedings were reported on in the in a newspaper? Well, one should look both at the journalism, but also in a way uh, various meetings ha were reported in general, both in narrative sources and especially later in newspapers and in official documents. And as it's a place of discussion, why don't you look at both political and official language and obviously debates, various, and also as it's a place where laws are formed through discussion, etc. it's kind of tempting to look how, uh, well, basically an order or a spoken word, word spoken by someone became a written order, document, law, whatever you want. And the fi this final matter is what I would like to take a brief glance at now. So uh, actually, the, as we can all uh, guess, the relationship between the oral and written uh, form of an order or a document, let's say more or less, is not necessarily a simple one. We know that before Islam, there were documents used and authorized in Iran and obviously among the Arabs as well. Uh, we also know that, uh, however, for in uh, the early uh, Islamic law, let's put it that way, uh, for example, a written testimony was not a testimony. It was a mention, let's say a 
a mnemonic aid that you could call someone as a witness. They would del uh, tell you this or that, but you would still have to call them to have the actual, uh, let's say, uh, testimony. Kind of like the uh, sort, kind of like this PowerPoint right now. You have some notes from you kind of know what I'm going to say right now, but it's not the same as hearing it, yes? Plus it's actually mostly a mnemonic aid for me as well. Then, uh, so we can see that uh, for the early Islamic jurists, it wasn't as for, for us, we say that something is written, so we believe it, more or less. At the time, it was kind of the opposite. You would in general, kind of a bit mistrust what's written unless it's an authenticated in an oral form. Obviously, then in later periods, we would have various procedures devised uh, to, let's say, give more authority to a written word. Things I know, isnad, etc. Mm. And this brings us to the people who do the writing which has to be authorized, so secretary, scribes, etc., people who engage in what will be known as an uh, In various uh, Persian sources that I kind of called uh, the secretaries, I know I used the term scribes, maybe it was, uh, mm, well, a mistake on my part, uh, they are sometimes called uh, the tongues of kings, lesson al mulu. Yeah, so uh, it kind of shows that they are the ones doing the talking or actually writing for the king. Mm, and uh, also they are sometimes mentioned in various bureaucratic procedures, which further makes them kind of important, not only uh, by those who transfer spoken order onto uh, writing material, but also, they are sometimes mentioned as, in a way, giving authority that it actually happened. That's what we'll see later. But as we've mentioned, the Islamic law, we know that in Persian tradition, one in, uh, for example, recorded in Shahnameh, also, obviously, kingship predates writing. And in general, when we read it, the kings kind of never write something down themselves. They say something. And they have a secretary, Dabir, Munshi, or whoever, who writes the stuff down uh, to give it proper form, as we'll see in a second. And when we reach kind of notes at the towards the end of my speech, uh, and uh, although we have sometimes mentions of uh, kings writing something themselves, I think it's uh, you can find one or two, or maybe even more. Just I. Didn't find them mentions in Torikh uh, Haki, for example. But uh, let's jump a few centuries later to play to see what were these various ways in which uh, the spoken word was transferred onto paper to become law or an order, and uh, what were some ways in which uh, it would be authorized and uh, made reflect better the things that were spoken. So, uh, as we know, in uh, the Safavid period, we have uh, such a position as Majles Nevis or Vore e Nevis, uh, who kind of works as a chief secretary, more or less. But we should look at the name he has, which is, uh, well, let's say assembly writer or uh, let's say notary or notary of occurrences. So it would seem that at the beginning he was either writing stuff happening at the court, for example, as would be uh, with similar positions in Mughal India uh, and only later became mostly uh, the mm, kind of a secretary. But we can see, I won't read the whole text because I hope you can see the presentation, that it's a different slide right now. Yes, we can. Thank God. Okay. So uh, we can see that uh, 
the duty duties of such a uh, Majlis Nevis was basically writing down documents which were given to him either by word of mouth or from other officials uh, in writing based on the word of mouth uh, given by uh, to them by the king. Mm. And then he would prepare a note and as we'll see it was later written down or finished by uh mm, let's say the people working under him what's also interesting is that the term used for the documents drafted by him was ragam i know it was kind of one of the more common terms for a document uh but if we look at the uh mm, for example monshaot from the period of uh mm, razvini who was who held the position of Majlis Nevis at some time on, on, during a, a certain period? Uh, we see that there's kind of a clear section, kind of of his monshaot, where you can find things which are called either in the title of the document or in the its text ragam, uh, which would seem that they were the at least at that time, possibly documents written this procedure, although I do not feel, um, let's say, uh, um, certain enough to kind of force this view. It's kind of more a hunch because you can see as many, uh, let's say, uh, arguments against it and as for it. Uh, uh, so uh, here, just for example, what would be these, what would be these types of authentications? You can find, let's say, more uh, detailed discussion of this particular issue, even in well, quite old already work by Busse. Uh, mm, I've forgotten the title, maybe because it's in German. But we can see that in a case, the documents written by uh, mm, Majlis Nevis were directly reflecting the spoken word from uh, from the Shah. They would he would simply write, as we can see, Bel al Eliel And if it was transmitted to him by someone else, then as we can see uh, below here, there would be the inclusion of the entire quote unquote isnad yeah how it was transferred and by whom obviously with titles etc obviously it would also be authorized with relevant seals but now let's focus on some other stuff which is important here in my opinion uh, mm, as we've mentioned uh while this majles nevis would write a general text of the document then it would again be filled, uh, let's say some blank spaces would be filled by uh, his, let's say inferiors, his subordinates. Uh, so we have kind of this thing that a document is first said by, or order given by the Shah or someone else to the guy or uh, to another person who relay, uh, retell, tells it or gives a note to, uh, the Majlis Nevis, then he would write the stuff down in a proper way, let's say, leaving some spaces just to be filled by uh, mm, the guy who would be finalizing mm, the text. Mm. Also, sometimes would have obviously the document written on the letter or petition that was received, which shows that sometimes the whole procedure was done basically on the spot uh, in this majlis of a king. So it's almost like uh, the text is read to the king, the king answers, and the right answer is written down. So it kind of has this bit, uh, let's say, uh, feeling of minutes of a meeting, especially when we consider that uh, uh, while uh, I don't have any uh, idea right now of uh, such minutes or court uh, journals from the Soviet period, it would not be far off to think that something like that existed, 
given that it existed in uh, the Mughal India and uh, the name of the official responsible for it was Vorenevis or one or so it kind of um, uh, feels that um, something like that might have existed, especially if we look at uh, one of uh, actually historical works uh, from the period, uh, Vahid Razvini's Jahon uh, Roya Abbosi. And sometimes when he describes certain uh, ceremonies, occasions, court meetings, when you kind of remove a bit parts of uh, very stock phrases used for ornamentation, it looks almost in texts like these uh, or court notes you can find from, for example, uh, mm, Aurangzeb's period in India. So kind of an interesting thing to look at, although uh, it's still obviously speculation. And uh, as I've said, uh, mm, that uh, there is the problem, I think I've said it, with reflecting the spoken word. There's no problem with reflecting the spoken word on paper. That is, well, when we speak, we can lower our voice, for example. We can have the whole meeting or court organized properly to reflect, for example, the position of the speaker or, or of the shah. In, uh, in a written document, you have to achieve it otherwise. So one of methods would be obviously uh, by the use of proper titles, language, etc. And for this part, this uh, Majlis Nevis would obviously be responsible. But there are parts for which the, uh, the part responsible would be, let's say, the scribe. Now it's a correct term, I think, to use writing the final draft of or final text uh, when he would have to do it by the use of proper, let's say, uh, handwriting. After all, it's sometimes uh, said in uh, the source from the period, I think right now I'm uh, in Monsha uh, Ote Soleimoni that uh, for a scribe, good handwriting is like a good, uh, let's say, uh, face and tonation, et cetera, for, uh, for someone delivering something orally, obviously. And also the entire spatial organization of the document, how it looks and what we do when we receive it. Kind of, I, li I like to joke that a document is in a way, uh, mm, not maybe like a king in a paper form, but more maybe like a, a a court in a paper form. Yes, uh, as we can look at the uh, various accounts, what you do when you receive one, etc. And actually, one of the ways in which it would become such a representation, we can see it, especially in the Qajar period, when we, the Shaks write this uh, phrase Sahihas uh, uh, or scribble the phrase Sahihas, and then it kind of becomes something written by. Uh, by them, because when we look, for example, uh, at the uh, um, document, sometimes called Farmone Mashrute, it's often called in, in the periods Dastchat, uh, although it was obviously not written uh, by Shah by hand. And obviously, uh, this problem of transmitting the spoken word and the entire experience of meeting someone to the paper is not only present in documents. Obviously, it's a very uh, visible thing in Sufi literature, as I know uh, a lot of you know better than I do. Uh, for example, in the entire genre of Malfuzat, which is obviously in South Asia, but even in uh, these, let's say, Sufi hagiographies in uh, Iran, it can be kind of traceable that they give you a bit of experience of meeting someone. So that's like the very uh, simple sketch of we have, but we have to have some, uh, let's say, uh, jambandi at the end. So we have to look at the 
path a document takes finally after all uh, these words and words uh, to become a finished thing. We, first, obviously, we have some an idea in ruler's mind what to say, which is then spoken, recorded, and on the basis of this recording, a document with proper language befitting a monarch is drafted, kind of like today, uh, uh, even today, uh, when you have uh, Hansard, for example, of House of Commons in Britain, uh, sometimes you uh, a bit change phrasing used by the uh, uh, speakers uh, by, or by the MPs to uh, better fit the appropriate form of uh, parliamentary speech. Yes, uh, I am very sorry, but I have to ask you to to you know head towards the conclusion. Yes, so actually, that's the final slide. Okay. So then, from what's recorded the, after the document is drafted, it's given a proper not only text but entire visual representation. And yeah, that's uh, basically one of the things I'm trying to look at. So uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, I know it's a bit chaotic, because, but it's kind of a chaotic issue because, but when we look at the debates from the uh, first parliament, we can see kind of, let me go back, sorry, uh, between this step two and four, how it kind of is changed on the spot, which is for me kind of interesting. And uh, yeah, that's all. This is just a picture from uh, Munshot Vahide uh, Razvini. If you look at the second line, you can see this example that. Uh, uh, for example, someone is called Sultanat Panor, but then let's say insert name and titles, Fulon be al So, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, you. where do I press to stop the. Oh, I uh, stopped. Presentation, uh, yes. Stop. Okay. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, I really hate to interrupt, uh, but uh, this is what I'm for here. So, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I do hope to to go back to these issues during the uh, discussion because there are plenty of uh, angles and I'm sure many, many things that you would like to add. Uh, but now let us proceed to uh, the next speaker, uh, Dr. James Caron of the School of Oriental and African Studies uh, to present a paper, Mano in the post-truth uh, post world. Passionate Literary Theory and the War on Terror. The floor is yours, Dr. Karo. Great. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rakovetska Skari and um, Dr. Blagish for the invitation. I'm really happy to be here. Right. So <clears throat> for a while now, I've been involved in two grants, Reconceptualizing War. And in these, we focus not on linear events, but on changes in the structures of reality in which people think, feel, and live. Today, I want to talk about how the war on terror replicated its modes of being into a Persianate literary field, as seen in the work of a contemporary Pashto writer, uh, Abderrahim Muslim Dost. This is just one part of the overall project, and the overall project is how Afghan literary traditions, drawing on sciences of meaning and affect, like ilm mano and ilm badi, interact with ontological devastation. First, what do I mean by ontological devastation? During the Afghan Soviet war alone, a quarter of the population fled, landscapes were denuded, and agriculture now meant that you had to know munitions and helicopter sounds as intimately as you used to know water, weather, and plants. Life sustenance was now channeled through patronage either under the state or transnational mujahid organizations. Both the state and mujahideen encouraged rupture from the past to establish strategic supremacy over the future. Older social connectivities, institutions, and the knowledge they transmitted were eclipsed. In sum, all those intergenerational relationships that made things fit together in the world in a web of meaning, all that was broken in both material and social continuity. Earlier lifeways sometimes no longer made cognitive or emotional sense. Uh, my friend Fazal Marwat, a professor in Peshawar, illustrates this rupture in an anecdote. The classroom was full of young boys. They were told to draw pictures about their future. Images emerged of gunship pilots, uh, rocket launchers, etc. As the teacher looked at the pictures, he saw only one imagined a life as a gardener. So then he asked the group, where will your food come from? And their answer was, well, they'll give us our rations. So, you know, 
like older ways of, you know, even just how a country or society works um, no longer made sense to these boys born during the war. Now, understanding war as a reality changing exercise, that's not new. I mean, long before the ontological turn in anthropology, war wagers saw it this way. Some of you might remember a quote from the time of the US invasion of Iraq by a senior US official, supposedly Karl Rove, um, the Bush administration's uh, spin master. When challenged on the false claims that justified invasion, Rove repeatedly disparaged what he called the reality-based community, quote unquote, of researchers and journalists. And he said, we are an empire now, and when we act, we create our own reality. You assume an external reality exists and you try and study it. We know it doesn't really, reality doesn't exist until we make the narrative. Now, my projects focus on reality from the bottom up instead, you know, from the zone that's targeted for intervention. But in a project working with Pashto poets in Pakistan, they actually said something similar to Rove, uh, although in critique. They said that war is a strategic meaning, uh, a strategic destruction of our meaning by both the Pakistan army and the Taliban. And in order to create a blank slate onto which they can then write the future in their own preferred image. So, well, Karl Rove was pointing to an intervention in narratives in a society's perception of reality, but the poets went further. They pointed out that the army and the Taliban actually rarely used narrative or language at all. They pointed out, the poets did, that the army and the Taliban um, act, like communicated instead through material violence that altered the meaningscape of the physical environment. Kali Rubai makes a similar point in her ethnography of farmers in Anbar province, Iraq, and the non-lethal counterinsurgency tactics they were subjected to, like blast walls and controlled spatiality checkpoints and the like. She says, for them, counterterrorism is a modus operandi that affects whole populations in the same ways that torture strategies may affect an individual by distorting their world until they cannot make meaning out of anything. So discursive and material reality are just two parts of one holistic fabric. And when you're the target of intervention, this holism is much more immediate than for, say, Karl Rove, whose PR job is premised on discourse and narrative being the most prior thing. For Pashto poets, like many in post-Ishraqi Persianate traditions, uh, language, affect, and material are often linked in a metaphysics of meaning, or mana, that is linguistic, but also embodied. Now, in his book on classical Arabic, mana, uh, Alexander Key notes that the language sciences are basically sciences of affect and affecting. Um, khayals and manas produce imprint on the soul, and in doing so, they even constitute the individuated being. But all intersubjective sense information processing, even just material interaction, like through your hissy senses, um, all intersubjective uh, information processing does that. And in popular poetics that draw on Pashto borderland Sufi practice, as much as classical Arab poetics, Ma'ana itself is located in the metaphysical dimension and it interacts with both language and matter. An example of this might be the contemporary poet Pir Mohamed Karwan and his vision of the Soviet and Taliban eras. Karwan says that he learned poetry from objects in his pre-war semi-nomadic childhood life in Khost watching how mountains and rainbows constitute each other and create mana, how um, beekeepers and bees do. Through input from his mullah father, trained in Pashto Sufi poetics, uh, these material observations were filtered through an epistemology of khayal and mana. Meanwhile, Karwan's understanding of khayal and mana get even more located in concrete material relations as a result of his material observations. So for Karwan, interactions between between imagined deer and wolves, for instance, deal in the same manners as interactions between physical ones do. And the manawi lives of abstract hyper objects like militaries and markets play out in individual human and non-human actors whose souls, but also bodies, are shaped by those hyper objects. Soviet pilots emerge as human airplane cyborgs, channeling their hardware and their uh, the strength of their military assemblage, like globally, into their bodies. Uh, toxic munitions poison the forest and make its deer mutate into enraged killers of wolves. War and domination, as the higher order meanings of war objects, affect the higher order life of everything. And it sort of ripples throughout the entire society and social order. And 
Uh, but at the same time, imagination and poetic creation operating in higher order reality is therefore also a way to affect materiality through those same higher order metaphysical realms. So like poetry emerges for Karwan as a sort of occult route to peace activism. Now, Karwan's process philosophy, building on metaphysical poetics, was one way that literature responded to uh, war and ontological devastation. In this ontology, there's never no reality because intersubjectivity constitutes everything, even if in alienation and violence. And this therefore raises ethical political questions about how you live in the world with others on an everyday level. But today, I want to leave Karwan aside and talk about a second trajectory. In this second one, Karwan's post-traditional ontology is undermined in favor of the nihilism of, of PR or counterinsurgency, which aim at deliberate tactical destruction of meaning and then remaking it. This second trajectory, this nihilistic trajectory of Pashto literary development is, I would say, an epistemology rather than an ontology. It's one in which reality, apart from God, is merely subjective perception that can be deconstituted as a lead to constituting some other ideal new world. It's a quasi Karl Rovian faith in language as supreme. I'm going to argue this, as I said, through a look at the works of Abrahim Muslim Dost and how his literary theory practice is shaped by his roles in the war on terror, first as a detainee and then as an Islamic State activist. I'll talk about his two largest works, both in Pashto. The first one is called the Pashto Ma'ana Badi and the Shir Dewaluna which is a pedagogical manual of the linguistic art sciences. The second book is the Guantanamo Mate Zawlani. It's a memoir about his three and a half years spent in various black sites in Pakistan and Afghanistan, and then in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. But I'll start with the manual. So that's the book I came across first. At, seen, at first, it seemed pretty unremarkable, a practical poetics manual that draws heavily on the system uh, of al Jurjani, the 11th century theorist. And it outlined like, much like most of those manuals do, it outlines a taxonomy of ways to make meaning as well as affect through the language art sciences. Much like other manuals since the 11th century in Arabic and Persian, it does this with illustrative examples. Most of them are from Muslim Dost's own poetry. In this, um, in this system, in contrast to most local uh, traditions, like the one that Karwan drew upon, um, embodiment and extramental reality are actually of very limited interest. As Alexander Key describes it, manuals in this tradition tend to be concerned strictly with the mind, how grammatic processes produce syntax, how image metaphors are built, and how they combine to create affect. Links to a wider metaphysics could be made, as Avicenna did before Georgiani, but for the practical manuals that developed from Georgianian poetics, such considerations tend to be set to the side. Now, I didn't know much about the author of this manual when I first read it, but it struck me for a couple of reasons. First, it's the most rigorous and voluminous uh, manual in the, of this genre that I've ever seen in Pashto of any period. And I've been at this for like 15 years now. Um, and I was doubly interested because it was so recent. It was 2018. I later learned that Muslim Dost trained in the Saudi-run International Islamic University in Islamabad and then in Mecca. He specialized in Hadith sciences, which obviously require substantial training in traditional Arabic linguistics, too. His income came from his gemstone business, but he also worked as a satirical columnist in Urdu, Arabic, and Pashto media. So basically, his main intellectual activity drew on classical education and language, and also sat at the border of like this right-wing Pakistani and fringe Arab media. And he found a niche translating between these two spheres to each other, um, because he was organizing funding drives in the Gulf for local causes in Pakistan and Afghanistan. So what I'm saying is it's not only his training, but his experience in persuasion and recruitment that made him particularly attuned to the power of deliberate masterful attention to language and rhetoric. Anyway, so just a few things actually initially struck me about the manual. First is its scope and its rigor, which is unique in Pashto, as in like actually the genre itself doesn't show up in Pashto almost I mean, Pashto scholars frequently knew and employed and even discussed this poetics, but they usually re-theorized it within broader cosmologies, and they did so organically in verse, not in these like, you know, pedagogic manuals. Second, the manual's theory of translation actually does differ from the Georgiani tradition. For Georgiani, language access is abstract 
abstract mana that live in universal logic beyond language. And so therefore any meaning can be replicated in any language. In contrast, Muslim Dost draws on the same Dragenian vocabularies, but he then argues that some meanings can only exist in the bounds of a particular language, either Arabic or Pashto. My point here is Muslim Dost's work implies a higher priority of language as a maker of reality than even the foundational theory did. Now, when I read this manual, I didn't know who the author was, but his name seemed familiar. When I looked further, I remembered before this, he published a better known book, this like scathing prison memoir that got some coverage in Pakistani news. Meanwhile, the global press focused on how he was falsely arrested and especially that he composed poetry in prison. After he was released, when he helped found the Islamic State Khurasan province some years later, and he ran its public relations activities, Western journalists then followed up with like this betrayal, you know, our token good guy wasn't so good after all. So that's why I heard his name before. Now, this media frame speaks to wartime liberal society's desire to tell enemies from allies. But actually, the memoir turned out to be way more interesting than such narrow concerns. Initially, I read it separate from the literary manual, but I did read it for things like embodiment, affect, and language. Um, and in that, you know, the, the two sides of my earlier remark about how your radically altered material landscape and torture strategies can be functionally similar, I mean, really hit home. Muslim says he was never systematically tortured because no one ever, ever actually believed he was a combatant. Um, but he does point out a pervasive nefsiaki feshar or psychological pressure. Each prison he entered was calibrated to place people in a radically alienating surroundings. Um, and so that Karwan style of fusion with material environment was impossible when everything was so blank and depressive, right? I mean, there's no mana that could result apart from aporia. Everything was blank cement, darkness, white noise machines, um, and any connection to pre-war materiality, even in one's own body, was radically disrupted. He describes how he was processed into the CIA prison in Kandahar. He had his head, beard, and eyebrows shaved. He was put in a, like a blank jumpsuit. Then he was taken to see his brother Badr, who was arrested with him. Muslim Dost said that looking at Badr in such a transformed state and seeing Badr looking back at him, him in an ident in identical state. That was the most painful experience of the whole time, he said. Even the one thing they had left, their bodies, were now reduced to these uniform blank canvases. So Muslim Dost's new sensory worlds were not connectable to any prior chains of meaning, nor that were they translatable into feelings or emotions that had recognizable names because everything like was meaningless. And so these new sensory information, how do you process that into emotions? Also, inmates were usually unable to talk to each other, so they couldn't even connect to shared mental worlds from before. The connections that they did have instead were conversations with interrogators. And maybe 15% of the memoir is like quoted descriptions of these. They all take the frustrating form of the same questions over and over. Muslim Dost uh, attempts to persuade dozens of interrogators that he had no role in militant organizations. He had no weapons stockpiled in Pakistan. He had no intelligence interesting to NATO. The reader quickly appreciates that truth is beside the point in these interrogations. The CIA, again, was aware early on that Muslim Dost was falsely arrested at this point. Instead, these were basically exercises to establish the interrogator and his military as the arbiter of reality. And this manifests in microcosm, uh, just the general futility of truth amidst the general society-wide breakdown of reality, which again is a tactical feature of war and not a bug. And here's where poetics comes in. The interrogators attempt to dominate and destabilize more than they attempt to gain information. But meanwhile, Muslim Dost in these interrogations, he's experimenting with rhetoric in different states, such as indignation or withdrawal or sincerity or even humor, um, just in order to test their affective results. And this was for survival. Like once, unexpected sexualized humor on his part derailed the interrogator and actually spared him from what was going to be a pretty severe beating. Anyway, to sum it up, apart from alienation, what Muslim Ghost had in prison was two things. First thing, poetry, floating around through his own mind and nowhere else. It was Pashto poetry, but unlike traditional poetry, it was divorced from the extramental world, the world outside, and existed only in its bounded abstract space. On the other hand, he was endlessly forced into performing language as rhetoric, 
this too was removed from any reality apart from just the speech act and the, the power to create reality in the speech acts. Uh, then, as I said before, by 2015, after having been released for almost a decade, Muslim Dost redeployed this understanding of language and its reality creating effects in his role not only as a founding member of Daesh in Afghanistan, but as its chief public relations officer and recruitment head. Now, these two works at first seemed unrelated. One of them is scientific taxonomy. The other one is narrative prose. But when I reread them together, they actually didn't seem so disconnected. A huge amount of the poetic and prose examples in the manual, the later manual, actually appeared first in the memoir in, and were used to describe his experiences. Then it struck me that Muslim Dost's interrogations were essentially demands for Bayan uh, from a person who has extensively studied Ilme Bayan, um, along with all the affect management that goes into that discipline. When you read these, when you read the, the memoir this way, you notice how so much of the memoir is actually well-executed theory of just the sort of thing that his manual teaches. So I think the works are related. Just like Karawan saw poetry in the physical landscape, I think that Muslim Dost reflected on his prison experiences through the lens of literary theory and then wrote a memoir informed by it. It's much more clear even that he wrote his theory manual with that memoir still in his mind. At the same time, these two works are still superficially disconnected and that contrasts with the holistic way that literary theory, experimental reality and activism have been handled more usually in Pashto literary life which is to say in one and the same poetic texts linked by metaphysics, as I described earlier. To conclude here, my argument is not that the war on terror somehow directly created Muslim Dost's literary theory. His discussion of reality and unreality reduces them, or reduces reality and unreality to just felicitous or infelicitous relations between images and ideas. But really that's true of post jurjani poetics, generally speaking. Um, his insistence that reality can be so relative as to exist only in one linguistic container, that's a bit more unusual. But mainly, all I'm saying is that the war on terror was this nihilistic destruction of reality across many scales and planes. And I suggest that Muslim Dost's immersive experiences in it could be partly why he would choose this genre um, when so few other Pashtun scholars have ever done so. In both war and in Georgianian poetics, for different reasons, language forms a self-enclosed reality and brackets off any meaning outside its self-determined boundaries. And that's what the Islamic State, just like Karl Rove, seeks to do. So anyway, in the context of a metaphysically aware literary field like Pashto poetry, at least, this manual is a war era redirection. And that's kind of where I want to end up. Um, we can talk more about any part of this. Uh, obviously, I've got plenty more to, to say, but um, I know we've been really trying to keep to a, a strict schedule. Yes, so please. <laughs> thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, it's really very unpleasant to remind you about uh, the timing, but uh, that's that's what I did. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you so much uh, for this, uh, all the speakers and uh, and the attendees uh, for uh, taking part in this first session. And uh, let us have some tea or whatever, uh, like for five minutes. So uh, we will be back at uh, uh, four twenty six. Uh, if that's fine, and uh, Matos, please stop the recording right now. Uh, we will. Rec